say hi to somebody. Hey.
Father. Thank you that you, you are the God. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you are, you are our Father. And you cradle us in your arms. And you hold us no matter what. And we thank you for that. In your name we pray.
Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. Palm Sunday. Day of celebration. Day of shouting. A day when Jesus walked, not walked, rode through the streets of Jerusalem. All the people shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For they thought he was coming to set up his kingdom. They thought he would take the throne. They thought he would take care of the Roman Empire. But he was coming into Jerusalem to start his last week on earth. He was starting his last few moments of a very long journey to the cross. A journey that started way back in the book of Genesis. The book of beginnings. And at And at the start of this series of special services, I've been led back to the beginning. Not as far back as I thought I would be led, because I didn't go all the way back to Genesis 1-1. Okay? Uh, And and actually, I've wrestled as to where we would land this week, and... When I told Dawn what I was going to preach on this morning, she frowned at me and gave me one of those looks like I'd lost my mind. And maybe I have. Whatever mind I have left. But I personally believe that when Adam and Eve fell, Jesus started his walk to the cross, that he started his journey to the cross, and that's what this week is all about. This week of special services is starting this morning and going on every night this week is the journey to the cross, Jesus' journey to the cross. And I believe that when Adam and Eve fell, Jesus started that journey to the cross, It wasn't his last week on earth. It started back at the beginning in the book of Genesis, in the book of beginnings. That's what I believe personally. You may believe differently, and that's okay. You're entitled to be wrong. Anyway, let's let's look at this part, at this part of the journey. Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse... Six And it, this story is, is not a story that's preached a whole lot. Uh, it's not a story that is uh, talked about a whole lot. Um, it, it's not a story that's dug into a whole lot. Um, it, it's a story about two brothers. And um, two brothers that fought. Um... And uh, I don't know anything about brothers that fight. I never fought with my brothers. They, they picked it with me, um, and I just responded. Uh, but never had any problems with my brothers. I loved my brothers to death, love them today. We never have any problems, not at all. Never never had any trouble at all. Andrew keeps pointing to the altar like I should go in there and repent. But anyway. Um, but this week, the, the Lord has got me planted in this story. And we're going to be here all week long, the nights that I'll be preaching, the times that I'll be preaching. So you'll become very familiar with this story, okay, if you aren't already. And, and there's a... T- it's been amazing as I've studied this story. I know this story, have known it inside and out. But 
it's been amazing to me as I've restudied it this week, how the Lord has just opened up scripture. You know, God's word's amazing, isn't it? Every time you read it, every time you study it, every time you open it up, you learn something new. That's what is so neat about God's Word. I really cringe when somebody tells me they know all they know about God's Word. When somebody comes to me and they say, well, I've read the book of Genesis and I know all there is to know about the book of Genesis. And I go, oh, really? God has an infinite mind. And your mind is finite, and you know all the, all the mind of Christ on the book of Genesis then, huh? That's interesting. That means your mind is bigger than God's. That's a dangerous statement and a dangerous thought. And I think we better retract our statements when we think about those things. And, and the thing that I think is, is kind of really neat is that when we go back and we start looking at these stories again, how God opens up the word afresh and anew, and new based on where we are in our, in our walk with the Lord. Okay, enough preface. Let's look at Genesis 4. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out in the field, brother. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother, Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Now catch this right here, because this is important. Listen. God says right there, listen. Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Listen. Can you hear it? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now. You are under a curse and drive, driven, driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Listen. Your brother's blood. Listen. Your brother. Do you catch where we're going? Listen. Your brother's blood. Listen. Do you hear the blood calling you? Listen. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for this time that we're able to share together this week. We thank you for the service thus far this morning, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that we have to be in your presence and to worship you and to study your word and to grow together. And we pray, Lord, that you would unstop our ears and open our minds and soften our hearts, that we might hear what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We have to understand as we start this and as we delve into this that we are in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. And if we hear this book from one way, we hear it from uh, its historical perspective, understanding how our story started, the creation of humanity, 
how God unveils that creation and that concept to us and how God explains, explains us. But if we hear it like that, we hear it in a very limited way. Because the Bible is not inclined to just be a book of history, nor is it to be a book of psychology to explain us. It is really meant to unfold and unravel and explain and reveal and glimpse God's plan for man. And if we understand it from that context, we begin to understand why a principle called the law, called the law, uh, a principle uh, called the law of first mention has so much power. Because we see God saying through the concept of the law of first mention, where God says, I am consistent. However I started in Genesis, I will continue that theme through to Revelation with that same theme. I won't start out redemption with fabric and end up with redemption with fur. If I started it with fabric, I will end it with fabric. If I start it with blood, I will end it with blood. I'm setting the roots, the tone, the foundation for the ancestry of your thought. So that we are not looking at these strangers that we don't know with an abstract curiosity as to what went on in their lives. Nor are we peeking into the windows of another family's life to understand what is going on in our neighbor's yard. But we are looking down through time at our own roots, at our own ancestry. And understanding how we got here and what God is going to do through us. And if we read it with that context, it becomes relevant. If we read it any other way, it is purely educational. And this is not a school. And I'm not here to teach you a university class. This is a church. So it's, not, so it's not important that you only see it from the perspective of gathering information, but rather revelation, revelation to understand that Satan has never posed a question that God did not have an answer for. Oh, I want to say that again because as we start this week of journeying, we need to get that down in our spirit. Satan has never, ever posed a question that God did not have an answer for. That we do not serve a God that sat, that's waiting on Satan to do something. That, and then he calls after Satan does something, God calls a board meeting and says, Oh my, what are we going to do now? What, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Oh, you have a pastor that may be like that. But you don't have a God that's like that. Because you have a pastor that is surprised by things that happen from time to time. But you do not have a God that is surprised at any time by anything that has ever happened. Therefore, God does not react. He acts. He's sovereign. Whoever reacts has lost control. The control is in the hands of the person that has caused the reaction. God is not a reactor. He is an actor. He acts. He makes judicial decisions. It is what it is. He has the answer before you ask the question. He has determined the end before the beginning. He is God and he's sovereign and he's ruler over the universe. He sits on the circle of the earth. He has all the power in the palm of his hand. Too much of our attention today is wrapped up in knowing how to have church. Oh, you see, we know all about church. We know when to stand and we know when to sit and we know how to hold up our hands and we know when to dance and we know when to greet people and we know how to have church because most of us focus, most of our focus is knowing, 
is, no, is on knowing church rather than knowing God. Knowing church will make you fit in with the crowd, but knowing God will make you fit in with heaven. We didn't get all dressed up this morning and get in our cars and drive down the road and walk in here so that we can get to know each other because knowing you is nice, but knowing God is redemption. Knowing God is life. Knowing God is healing. Knowing God is help. Knowing God is wholeness. Uh, knowing God is fullness. Knowing God is peace. Knowing God is solidarity. Knowing God is consistency. Knowing God is understanding who I'm supposed to reflect. Who I, who I am the image of. Knowing God is knowing my daddy. And I don't have to take a look Take a little bit of my DNA and send it off to somebody I don't know to figure out where I came from because he's my alpha and my omega. He's my beginning and my end. He's my first and my last and everything in between. He is God. There, there's not, he's, there's not a black God and a white God and a Canadian God and an African God and an American God and a Democratic God and a Republican God. God. There is simply God, God all by himself. He was God before there was anybody there to tell him he was God. Nobody voted him in and nobody can take him out. He is God all by himself. Before the angels ever opened up their hymn books, he was still God. Before thunder ever clapped his hands, he was God. Before water fell over the waterfall, he was God. Before there was a west coast and an east coast, a north and a south, he was God. Before there was a Pluto and a Saturn and a Mercury, he was God. So his thoughts, his mind, his ideas, his ways are, are, are like my wife crocheting gloves for my grandson's superhero outfits. Yarn by yarn and piece by piece with her crochet hook. She crochets it to get all together until it is one fabric. Composed of a thread that would not quit. So we pick up the thread in the book of Genesis. And we pick up the thread by understanding that we have just experienced the great fall. Of humanity. The great fall of humanity. Through the greatest seduction we have ever seen. Because the enemy has seduced humanity. Out of its place. All because the enemy has fallen from his power. Jesus said in, in the book of Luke, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So the enemy's looking for something to run. And he comes into the earth realm where God has given man dominion. And he says, hmm, I think I can steal your power. And he's still after your power today. So he seduces the woman. He deceived her into taking, and I'm not going to go down all the rabbit holes that Pastor Watts went down Wednesday night. Because I'm not going to open this up for discussion. Okay? But he deceived her into taking the one thing that God said they couldn't touch. And, it, and all hell broke loose. Now, not when she ate, but when she took what the enemy had given to her and offered it to Adam. And when Adam fell, according to the scripture, all of humanity fell with him. You can read it in the book of Romans. Wow. What a prize to get. If you smite the head, you get the body. So Eve has to live with the fact that she got duped. She wasn't right about everything. And that man now 
is run out of the garden. The place that God designed. Wouldn't you like God to design your house? I mean, think about it. To design every creek that flows. uh, The rhythm to which it flows. To design the water that cascades over the rocks. To know that when you get up in the morning that... That you could go take a shower and you don't have to pay a water bill. Wouldn't you like God to design the sound of water going against the rocks so that you could go to sleep with the temple of the waves against the rocks at night? God designed a utopia for man to live in. Such a very special and unique place, a garden with flowers that would grow without tilling the soil or working the ground or pulling weeds. And vegetables and fruits are just hanging from the trees and the the leaves on the trees are for the healing of the nations and it's all designed so that you can be well and stay well and move well and live well with no arthritis pain. A place where there is no sickness and there is no death and there is no torment. There is no fatigue. There is no disease. There is no COVID. There is no flu. There isn't even a sniffle or a fever or a cold. That's why I can't wait to get to heaven. Because when I get to heaven, I'm going to walk up to Adam and slap him. But just one time. Just, just one slap, just one good slap for all the overtime and all the second jobs and all the times the electric was cut off and all the times that I almost got evicted and all the times I almost lost my mind and all the times I couldn't sleep at night and all the indigestion and all the disease and all the torment. It, it seems like I ought to get just one slap. Just a Christian slap. Don't you think? Well, they got kicked out of the garden. <clears throat> Whether I get my slap or not. And with, and with flaming swords of fire, they were evicted from this utopia garden. And all that they owned was set outside the gates. And, there, and they are the first homeless people. And they are the first dysfunctional family. So stop trying to tell me how functional your family is. And show me all those beautiful pictures on Facebook about how you don't have any problems. Because the Bible has already revealed that that if the first family is dysfunctional. I mean remember the law of first mention right? There's no need of you looking down your nose at me when I get in trouble. It's just just that mine hit the paper and yours didn't. Every family has its drama. So stop wishing you could be in someone else's house because they're crazy too. Rich people, being rich don't stop crazy. Being white don't stop crazy. Being black don't stop crazy. Being Republican don't stop crazy. Being Democrat don't stop crazy. Being pretty don't stop crazy. All of us got our own brand of crazy in some kind of way. I mean, you know, we just got to be real around here, right? If you can't handle it, then maybe we ought to have a talk. I mean, that's that's why we all just might as well worship together. We don't need all these different churches all segregated out. We just need church because we're all crazy. And we all need Jesus. And we all need the blood. And we all need to be set free. And we all need to stop putting these folk over here and these folk over here and these folk over here. Get all of that out of here and get all that segregation out of here because segregation doesn't stop you from being dysfunctional. We all just need to come together as one under the blood of Jesus Christ. 
You see, you see the craziness that starts in the, ch- in the fourth chapter of Genesis didn't start in the fourth chapter. It dripped into the fourth chapter. It stained the fourth chapter. It slid into the fourth chapter. It really started in chapter 3. We're looking at the second generation of crazy. And that's what makes raising children so tough. Because they're the next generation of your crazy. And they go crazy. And when, you, when you're getting tired and your back is hurting and your feet are swollen and you're trying to deal with them and you say, I don't know how you can, you ought to shut up. Because the Cain and Abel kind of crazy started with the Adam and Eve kind of crazy. Which doesn't give you a right to blame where you came from. But it does give you an obligation to understand that if you're not careful, it won't stop with you. Because there's consequences. Adam took the fruit or whatever it was from the woman. He should have never have done it in the first place. Because it was his responsibility to provide. All the men, you all listen to me now, all the men who won't work should be squirming right now. It was never God's design for you to eat off the woman. Not only, oh, you all got quiet real quick. Not only is it not God's plan, but you lose something, men. You lose something positionally. You lose something in terms of authority. You lose something when you have to come in and say, I need gas money so I can go to the store. She's not your mama. Well, now you might call her mama, but she's not your mama. No, I know I'm not talking about, I I shouldn't be getting into all of that, should I? Because that's not in chapter 4, is it? I I better get out of that because I'll get myself in trouble. But, But I want you to know something, sweetheart. This is just for you. Just for you. I I'm I'm going to always have some kind of job. Okay? I I I may not make as much as you. And even, even if I don't make as much, I'm going to be an addition. I'm, I'm not going to be a subtraction. I'm not going to be a liability. You're going to be glad to see me coming because when I walk through the door, you're going to say, here comes help. This isn't about who makes as much, but I'm going to be some kind of help. And what happens at home is what should be happening in the church. And the problem that we're having in the church is what happened in the garden that day. We're not getting the help that we need from the leaders of the family. I refuse to be a deadbeat Johnny come ladies lately zero that doesn't make that doesn't change the sum total of my house. I'm going to change it some kind of way. If I can't find something, I'll cut the grass. I'll paint the house. I'll fix the roof. I'm not going to lay on the couch and watch soap operas all day. Okay, let me get out of that and get back to the first family and and, and get back to where we need. Because I think this is getting too close to home. All of a sudden, Adam and Eve knew that, 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 that they were naked and they were ashamed. And Adam did what was done to him. Because sin separated him from his source. So he separated the fig leaves from their source. Because hurt people hurt people. And Adam is separated from God. And the fig leaves are separated from the fig vine. And he's trying to sow something together that's dying while he's sowing it. 
and he hides himself from a living God, but a living God is looking for a living son, and the living son is dying. And he is covering, him, covering himself with dying fig leaves. And then God assumes the responsibility of redemption. And God goes out and finds an innocent animal for sacrifice and kills the sacrifice. And with blood running down Adam's thighs, God covers his nakedness with the warm skins of an animal who gave himself as a substitution that Adam might be redeemed. Well, you see, we have to understand that. Because if you don't trace chapter 4 back to chapter 3, we don't understand the hints of the problems that broke out in chapter 4. If we don't trace the fact that redemption started in chapter 3, we won't pick up the hints and, and what took place in chapter 4. We'll miss it all. And we'll pick up more there tomorrow night. So you got to come back tomorrow night. You got to come back tonight to hear Pastor Watts. But you got to come back tomorrow night to pick up more of the story, right? Paul Harvey. But what I, what I want, to, want you to see from chapter 3 is the sacrifice that God made for redemption. The blood that was shed there in chapter 3. But also what God said to the woman. There in chapter 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the, and the woman and, put thy, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This starts the journey to the cross. This is the first glimpse we get of the plan of salvation. The plan that God gives for the redemption of man. That the enemy is going to get his. That the enemy is going to be defeated. But then down in verse 21 of chapter 3, we see the blood. Because God made coats of skins and clothed them. Blood had to be shed to cover the sin Blood had to be shed to satisfy the price for the penalty of disobedience. There had to be blood shed in the worship of the Lord. Oh, we have to pick up on that here in chapter 3 in order to understand what's happening over in chapter 4. In order to pick up on what's take, what takes place in chapter 4. In order to listen to the blood. In order to understand the significance of the blood. You see, you can't get into the kingdom any other way but through the blood of Jesus Christ. We can come in here and shout. We can come in here and sing. We can come in here and drink our coffee and have a good time. And walk out with good warm and fuzzies. But if you don't have the blood applied to your life. If you don't make a visit to a fountain that is filled with blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Oh, if you don't get to that fountain, you're not part of the kingdom of God this morning. And I know that's a harsh statement. I know that it may not be seeker friendly this morning. But I've got to keep it real because... This world is going to hell in a handbasket. And that's what the word says. If your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, you're not walking in the kingdom of God this morning. There's only one way to make sure that your name is there. And that's walking through the blood. That's being plunged into the fountain. That's coming to Jesus today. Oh, oh, the ones that, that lined the street of Jerusalem that day and shouted, Hosanna, and they worshiped the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But a few days later, they shouted again, and they shouted, Crucify Him. And they hung Him on a cross. 
But you see, with a real heart change, with a real washing of sin, it's a little harder to shout, crucify him. When you have a taste of heaven here on earth, it's a little harder to turn your, black, turn your back on him. I want to know this morning, will you listen to the blood that's calling you today? Listen. 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 Holy Spirit is speaking to you today. It's your day. Oh, you see, Jesus started that journey back there in Genesis. Yes, he finished to the, 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 he shed his blood on the cross. And he rose again from the tomb, and that's what we'll celebrate next Sunday. But you see, we ought to celebrate that every day. Because he's alive. We don't serve a dead Savior. We don't serve someone who's still hanging on that cross. That's why it's empty. That's why the tomb is empty. You can't go to the tomb and find his body. It's not there. He's interceding for you right now. But you can come to a fountain that's filled with his blood and apply it to your heart and have your sin washed white as snow and get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life this morning. Will you? Let's stand together. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, even before the music starts, come. Right now, come. You're at home this morning. You don't know Jesus is your Savior. Kneel at that coffee table, that sofa, that chair. You're in your car. Just bow your head and pray right now. Just open your heart and invite Jesus to come in. Say, Lord, I need the blood. I need the blood. He died for you today. He's calling you. Lord, I believe your spirit is here and it's working. It's moving. It's calling people. Help us to listen. And respond. In Jesus' name. God's speaking to you. Come. Don't wait. Come right now. Come and move.
me Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me What a sacrifice that saved my life Yes, the blood, it is my victory this day seeing my need our need to cleanse us white as snow thank you Lord praise your name bless you Jesus name Bless the Lord. Okay, so tonight begins our Journey to the Cross revival. Uh, it's going to happen every night this week, starting tonight, ending on Friday, and then we'll have our regular services on Sunday. Uh, at 7 o'clock, uh, there will be uh, Children's Church every night except for Friday night. Friday night will be everybody in here. Um, and then on Resurrection Sunday, during the sunrise service at 7 a.m., there will also not be Children's Church. But then at 10.30, there will be Children's Church regularly. Um, so 7 p.m. every night this week. Good Friday is a kind of a drama and music um, service to prepare us for Resurrection Sunday. And you will not want to miss it. It is a powerful powerful service. Um, on Easter Sunday, the sunrise service is at 7 a.m. 
with breakfast around 8 a.m. and then our normal service at 1030. You won't want to miss it, Amen. especially because we're having a baptism on Easter Sunday Amen. at 7 a.m. You will not want to miss it. Amen. Um, Amen. I want to say thank you for everybody that came out on Friday to the Spring Fling Carnival. Um, it was a huge success, had a lot of families come. Uh, it was a blast. Um, if you didn't make it over to my table, I was a uh, very good carnival, uh, what do they call them, carnies? I was a very good carny. I uh, antagonized the children so that they would not win. I did a good job, I think. <laughs> no, but thank you. I, I have to say, I haven't seen the video yet, but I have to say, uh, I heard through the grapevine that Miss Jackie, the spirit <laughs> must have hit Miss Jackie during the cakewalk, during the, doing the cha-cha slide. Because my understanding is she got into the groove as she was going around that circle. So she wanted the cake. And then she won, I guess. So, so maybe one of these Sundays, the spirit might. And then our last announcement, because we have revival all week this week, there will be no life groups. So keep that in mind. Uh, on your seats or around your seats, there should be a connection card. If you've got a prayer request or a praise that you want uh, prayed over or worshiped with or celebrated with, um, Fill that out. If you're new, fill that out, and we would love to have your information. Let's stand and uh, pray over our tithes and offerings, and we'll go off shouting. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to give. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here on that terrible day so long ago. Mankind fell, and Lord, you bridged that gap. And so while we're here, we want to give back. And Lord, we pray that you would stretch every dollar that we have to the furthest of its ability. And Father, we pray that you would stretch us to the furthest of our ability as we give of ourselves back to the church and back to your kingdom. We thank you and we praise you for all that you have done, all that you're going to do.